Today, we're gonna to talk about a 16-year-old boy that murdered his entire family over a cassette tape. But before we get started, welcome to True Crime with Maneater. If you love all things true crime, including missing person cases, cold cases, and just the strange happenings of the world, you've come to the right place. Be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss a video upload. Let's get started. Bernard and Paulette Brahm had been living the American dream. They had a nice home in Rochester, Minnesota. As you can see from pictures, there's this long driveway you have to go up to even get to the house. So it was kind of set back into the woods a little bit. They had four children, Joe, who was 19, David, who was 16, Diane, who was 13, and Ricky, who was nine. They were actively involved in their church. And from the outside, the Brahms looked like your typical middle-class family. What many didn't realize is that the Brahm family was struggling with their 16-year-old son named David. David Brown was a 16-year-old attending school at a Catholic prep school. David was said to be the outcast of his strict Catholic family. He had recently been struggling with severe depressive episodes that had been getting progressively worse. He had even attempted suicide twice, and for six months he had been telling friends, classmates, and really anybody who would listen that he was going to kill his family, and nobody took him seriously. On the night of February 17, 1988, at approximately 11.30 p.m., David and his father Bernard had gotten into an argument. Apparently, Bernard did not want his son listening to a certain type of music, and this sparked a heated argument between the two. Obviously fed up with his son not listening to him, Bernard went to bed, but David had stayed up all night. He was very angry about this. He was so fed up. And then sometime between 1.30 and 3.30 a.m., he grabbed an ax, snuck into his parents' room, and started to strike his father with the ax over and over again until he murdered him. So authorities theorized that Bernard and Ricky had been attacked first, so he went into to his parents' room. He attacked Bernard until he killed him, and then he went down the hallway and began to attack Ricky, the nine-year-old. And then his sister and mother had heard what was happening, and they came out to investigate, and he attacked them both. Police said that Ricky, the nine-year-old, was found laying in bed in the fetal position, clutching a little blanket. He had massive head injuries and other injuries to his body from the axe. And it's really sad to hear that a little nine-year-old was clutching his blanket as he was dying. I'm sure there was utter confusion. I mean, this was his brother. His brother came in and started attacking him. It's just terrifying to think about. And this was a very bloody crime. I mean, he took an ax and he murdered four people in his family. And of course, you have to think about the fact that taking an ax and murdering somebody would be physically exhausting. And he did it to four people. I feel like that speaks volumes to the amount of rage he held towards his family. So the following morning, David goes to school as normal. Friends at school said that he dyed his hair black and shaved the hair from the sides of his head, but spiked up the back, which is completely different apparently from what he usually looked like. He would eventually convince a friend to skip school so he didn't go to classes all day but he ran into his friend and he convinced her to go with him. And as these two are skipping school, he tells her what he did. He goes into detail and says he murdered his whole family with an axe. I couldn't actually locate if this friend reported David to the police after she was safe and away from him but it doesn't seem like she did. In fact, by the end of that day, rumors had spread all around school that David had killed his family. So I don't know who started that rumor, if it was her telling other people because she was scared, or maybe she didn't believe it, but that rumor did start to spread. And police became involved when it was learned that Diane and Ricky didn't go to school, and Bernard hadn't gone to work. So obviously, that's a red flag. And phone calls to the Brom house kept going unanswered. So somebody called in and asked the police to do a welfare check on the family. So obviously, deputies are dispatched to the home to do a welfare check, and the first deputy on scene was Kevin Togerson. And he arrived at around 5 23 p.m. that night and he kind of felt uncomfortable so he was actually waiting for his backup to arrive but he was getting a little bit worried because it's 5 23 it's kind of getting dark out and they're worried that they're losing daylight hours and Kevin would say in an interview that all he really knew about this situation is that David had made some kind of threat towards his father and that something was obviously wrong with the family because nobody was able to get in touch with them so he really had no idea what he was walking into and then around 6 p.m. Kevin's partner arrives and he he kind of gets out of the car and he fills him in on the very little that he knows. They walk up to the door together and they begin knocking. They announce themselves. They say, it's the sheriff's department. We just want to check in on you. Are you guys okay? Of course, they get no response back. So they keep knocking. They keep announcing. And then they kind of get this bad feeling that something terrible has happened. So they open the door. They're calling out to the family. It's the sheriff's department. We're just making sure you're okay. Can somebody respond? Are you okay? And they're getting no response. So of course, they enter the house. They probably have their guns drawn 
this point because something is feeling very wrong. They start by investigating the downstairs. When they're finding nobody, they move towards the upstairs. As Kevin is going up these stairs, Kevin gets to just about the top of the stairs where he sees two sets of feet lying there. And he turns to his partner and he whispers, we've got two bodies up here, two females. And obviously they know that they could be in danger because they don't know what happened. They don't know if the killer is still there. They don't know what the situation is, but they know that they have to go up those stairs the rest of the way and figure it out. So they go up quietly. He says he looks to his left. And of course, he would see the massacre that happened in Bernard and Paulette's bedroom. Then he would make his way down the hall. And when he got to the last room, that's where he found nine-year-old Ricky still in bed. So obviously, they finished checking the house and they called it in because now they have an active crime scene. Initially, they fear for David's safety. His whole family was murdered. And now they think that possibly this 16-year-old could have been abducted. So they put an APB out and they're looking for this 16-year-old boy. So of course, they want to find out where the oldest Bronx son is because he's 19, he doesn't live at home, and he could be a suspect or his life could be in danger. But eventually they find him, they check his alibi, and they have to break the news to him that his family is murdered and they don't know where David is. And so as police are interviewing friends in the school, they soon realize that David was spotted at school even though he didn't attend classes and he was completely fine. And then they start hearing the rumors that David had threatened to kill his parents and that they weren't getting along and things like that. And they soon believe that David has often obviously a suspect. So they kind of switch from looking for a missing person to looking for a suspect. They would eventually find the murder weapon at the bottom of the basement stairs and it was covered in blood. And they would later determine that David struck his family members at least 56 times with that ax. So police searched all night for the 16 year old David Brom and they just could not find him. And I've kind of read some conflicting reports here about how he actually was found. Some articles say that somebody tipped them off when David went to make a phone call outside of a post office at a payphone and police rushed in and arrested him. Others say that David actually called from that payphone himself and turned himself in. So I'm not really sure which one is correct. Either way, he had spent the entire night in a cement culvert at a Rochester concrete plant. And as you can see from the picture, that would be incredibly uncomfortable to be sleeping there all night. He was taken into custody without any incident. And obviously after he was arrested, they went in and started to question him. If you've lived in Rochester, long enough. You've heard the name. This is him on his way to prison. It was the last time Rochester saw him. Brom, you've probably read the headlines. Five lives that are gone. I mean, they're literally gone. Remember the reports? The question Olmstead County authorities must decide now is whether to charge David Brom as a juvenile or as an adult. Watch the Brom family murder story play out on national television. Good evening. Topic tonight's News 11. Police charge a 16-year-old boy with four counts of first-degree murder after his family is found axed to death in their Rochester home. He admitted the crime and just said that he was, quote, having trouble with his father. And because David didn't give a lot of details other than the argument with his father that night about the music tape he was listening to, and some people said that he was sick of doing chores, there really isn't a lot to go on to determine why this 16-year-old kid murdered his entire family. And then the case just had so many twists and turns as it was going to trial. And this was because of his age and obviously his mental health. David Brom was treated for depression before the trial even began. And the DA wanted to try him as an adult, even though he was only 16. But a judge overruled this. And then it went to the Supreme Court where they ruled that he could be tried as an adult, although he was 16 at the time of the murders. So David Brom was going to be tried as an adult. And the trial itself was unusual. It was split into two parts. So the first part was determining if David Brom was actually guilty of the crimes. And because they had the murder weapon, the ax and his fingerprints and a palm print were lifted from it, along with his confession, he was found guilty. And then the second part of the trial was to determine if he was mentally ill during the time of the killings and did not know that what he was doing was wrong. And in both parts of the trial, they found David Brom to be guilty. They said that he knew what he was doing was wrong. They said that pretty much he planned this ahead of time. He had been telling people he was going to kill his family. Obviously, the first part of the trial, they had all that evidence against him and a confession. So he was found guilty. And during that time of the trial, he actually turned 
turned 18, but he never took the stand. In October of 1989, David was convicted of four counts of first-degree murder, and he's serving three consecutive life terms for those murders. And under state law at the time of the sentencing, a person serving life sentences is actually eligible for parole after serving 17 and a half years of their sentence for each term, which means David Brom could be considered for parole in the year 2041. He would be 71 years old at that point. He spent most of his entire life in prison. David Brom is now a 51 year old man and he is still incarcerated at the Minnesota Correctional Facility in Stillwater. And it continues to bother people all these years later. Why would he kill his family? I mean, did he just finally lose control and snap for a moment? Was he severely mentally ill and everyone kept missing the signs? There's a lot to kind of consider there because killing your entire family over a cassette tape really doesn't seem plausible. At the time, Patty Price was best friends with David's sister, Diane. She had been at the Brom house the weekend right before the murders. And in an interview, she kind of recounts the moment her mom had to tell her that her best friend had been murdered and that David did it. She went on to say that it was a Thursday and that Diane didn't go to school, but she hadn't thought much of it because obviously kids get sick. But when she got home that night, her mom came to her and broke the news. Her mom said, I don't know how to tell you this, but Diane is dead. Patty would say that her life became split at that point. She kind of recounts it as two sections, one before the murder and then one after the murder. That following Monday, students were actually bused to the funeral for the Brom family. And of course, it was closed casket. She remembers thinking that Diane was in that box, like her body was in there, and she couldn't really make sense of that at only 13 years old. What's really interesting about this is she actually never has blamed David for what he did, and she keeps in touch with him. She's written him numerous times over the years. She said, I've got nothing but compassion for him, and I just really wanted to know why. She also stated that he has written her a few times and that he has really come to terms with the fact that he's going to be in prison for the rest of his life. And although we don't have a 100% reason as to why David committed these crimes because he won't talk about it, he won't tell us specifically why, Patty Price actually has some theories about it. In an interview she stated, I have all sorts of theories about what happened with David, having to do with priests to be honest, but David has never been willing to talk about it. He talks about how much he misses his family. He regrets snapping the way he did. He talks about how much they loved him and he, you know, very much misses them. And I'm assuming Patty Price kind of came to these conclusions based off maybe some things that David had said in the letters. But early on, I did mention that his family was a very strict Catholic family. So he did have to attend church. And I think she's hitting on that perhaps something bad had happened to him while at church or it was a continuous thing that happened to him. And really he just got to his breaking point in all sorts of ways. Maybe he had told his family what happened, maybe he didn't. Uh, we can't confirm any of this without David Brom specifically telling us. But that's it for today, guys. If you like this video or any other video on my channel, be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss a video upload. And if there's a specific case you want me to cover, be sure to pop it in the comments below and I'll get to it. See you next time.